Welcome everybody. My name is Mike Kimhenna. I'm the, the executive director of Afikra. Thanks so much for joining. I'm really excited about today's event. Uh, it is my honor to introduce uh, fellow Beiruti and our special guest, Rima. Rima is a faculty member in the Department of English at the American University of Beirut. She's the founding editor of Rusted Radishes, Beirut Literary uh, Art Journal, which publishes, publishes artists and writers from Lebanon diaspora and is currently in its eighth circulation. Her essays can be found in the anthology Arab Women Voice uh, Realities. Um, and, and her essay, Days of Pearls, published in the Slag, uh, Slag Glass City, was nominated for the 2019 Pushcart Prize. She holds an MFA in creative nonfiction from the Vermont College of Fine Arts. Rima, welcome to Africa Conversations. Thank you so much, Mikey. So let's start um, a little biographically before we jump into the work. Um, when did you first start writing for pleasure? Uh, I mean, when I was a kid, uh, you know, we had, I had a journal um, that I thought like people were gonna read one day. Um, so I would like write it for this like imaginary audience. Um, and then like I destroyed it because <laughs> I just didn't want anybody to read it. Um, and then, yeah, so it was a very yeah, silly idea. A writer born. <laughs> that was a very silly idea of what a journal is. Um, but I mean, I actually wrote in it, uh, you know, I wrote my feelings, what was happening, my first trip to Lebanon. Um, and I was like, uh, I got very paranoid about uh, it, you know, somebody reading it and I destroyed it. So I actually don't have those memories anymore, which I regret. Um, but yeah, I always journaled uh, from a young age, from, you know, 11, 12 years old. Do you remember um, the first time you like had a quote, quote, literary journal that you got your hands on and was introduced to this concept of what a literary journal is? Do you remember reading anything like that the first time you started reading essays published in a magazine? Do you have a recollection of that moment or what publications really influenced you as a, as a kid or a young adult? Um, no, I don't. I don't. I mean, I, I had in college, we had these uh, literary journals that came out of the department. Um, but I didn't really dabble in them. I didn't, uh, it wasn't, you know, I wasn't into, into them necessarily. I was more into reading and reading novels, mostly, um, nonfiction, um, memoirs and things, but I, I didn't, you know, and essays, but I didn't necessarily think too much about literary journals until I came to, to Lebanon. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and part of that was this kind of this feeling, well, I, because I'm a teacher and I, and there was always a lot of good work that came out of our classrooms and we would talk about that, you know, there's a lot of talented writers and, you know, what are we going to do with this? And so I always had this feeling that I wanted to, you know, I had a blog, so I'd sometimes publish people's stuff on the blog. Um, and then, uh, somebody had actually started a literary journal in, in the department and then he left and we took it over. Uh, Crystal Hoffman and I, she's from, um, uh, from the US and she was there for a year and she's a poet. Um, and so we had a real great time getting it started and thinking about how we wanna publish our students. Um, but we also wanted to publish other people. Uh, so, you know, I didn't, I don't really have like a history with literary journals, um, but I always liked magazines, you know, and I always liked the form. Did you, um, so I want to read a, a little bit uh, about, from the about page of the Rust Radishes website, because I'm curious about sort of the conception of projects in general. So on the website, it says, founded in 2012 with the intention of creating a space for both emerging and established writers who have a connection to Lebanon. Over the years, we've published diverse work from bordering uh, countries, the diaspora and beyond. Um, as we evolved, we opened up submissions to people connected to the MENA region. Um, we do not insist on creating geographic uh, borders for submissions, but we do acknowledge that Beirut's re a revolving door of influences and cultures, its history and its perch on the Mediterranean is certainly at the heart of a unique convergence of voices. So my question is, in 2012, if I show, showed you that text, 
would you be, be like, no, that's not what we're doing right now? Would you be surprised by that text? Um, there's a few things I'd be surprised by. I think that we were able to articulate ourselves later. So this was written later, 2018, probably. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, you know, the way we used to articulate who we are was kind of uh, funny and also desperate. <laughs> I mean, we were also kind of like, who do we, you know, we, we want as many writers as possible. We don't want to put these restrictions, but we knew also that, you know, we wanted to highlight writers and artists from this part of the world who don't get highlighted regularly or usually. So they needed, you know, we wanted to give a space for that. Um, and we knew that there was room for it, but it was um, not easy to to reach people. Uh, we were we were soliciting about 80% of the journal at the beginning. Um, and uh, so, so what was then was that, you know, we, we, it's still the idea of connection to Lebanon state because the idea was that, um, you know, somehow you might have visited, you might have a relative, you might be married into Lebanon, you might, um, you know, be Lebanese living elsewhere. So that was kind of the idea that is broad like that. But then we, um, over time, the other editors were pushing for, you know, let's, let's push it to the region. And because first we started saying, what about the bordering countries? You know, you know. So let's let's mm -hmm. let's get those people in too, um, and then it expanded and it made sense um, in that regard. Uh, I'm not sure about the term Mina region, for example. I don't like the term necessarily. I don't know what else to call it. You know, some people say, what about the Mediterranean? Um, so that's something maybe you know we can talk about further. Um, and and that's why there's this disclaimer about geographic borders because it's not about it's not about borders, it's about culture, it's about, um, you know, uh, about, um, you know, I guess some sort of inclusivity of, um, of this part of the world and, and, you know, the voices that come out of here. So being particular about, about those. Yeah. Um, and so, and Beirut being, you know, and I think over time what we, what became clear too is that Beirut brings all kinds of people and you know it connects to so many people and so it is a place that is you know we all know it's a revolving door of not only people but ideas and and influences and you know um so so it is you know it is central to the to the project I think the fact that it's in Beirut you know different than it being in Amman or being um in any other city in the in the Middle East. Yeah. You know, I, I, to me, it made a lot of sense. I mean, I like the the, the tagline. I like a lot um, Beirut Literary and Art Journal because, I mean, Lebanon is is a political identity, right? Um, and 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 has borders and has sort of like all this like national national identity. Whereas like cities are for me, cities are so much easier to grasp. Like yeah. cities having identity that are actually organic versus national ones. Okay. Talking about moving on to talk about um, output, I'm also curious. Like, you go to the website, you publish a lot of different things. Like, there's a lot of media that that comes out um, through the journal. Was that also part of the initial conception that we're going to be publishing poetry and prose and drama and artwork and comics and reviews and interviews, um, translations? What? How has that changed over time? Well, the, the, all of those, influ you know, it, well, we did start off with all the major genres. So poetry and nonfiction, fiction, drama, and art and artwork as being non-literary, but we wanted that interdisciplinary, uh, you know, aspect. And we wanted it to be visual, you know, we wanted it, we thought it was, it's, literally thought it was just more interesting to have, um, especially for students too, because that was our, one of our main uh, audiences, you know, it's gotta be pretty somehow. Um, not to say that, you know, students are not attracted to words. I'm just saying like, there has to be some other appeal at the time yeah. it was what we were thinking. And also because we love art. Um, so uh, what happened is that translations and comics came in later. Reviews and interviews, you know, I'm, by the way, you know, what you're doing is really fantastic. I really love your project and I think it's so cool. Um, and I love this, this, you know, this event right now because all my friends are here. Um, and also because, <laughs> and because like you're my neighbor and I didn't know yeah. you before, somebody needs to interview you, Mikey. Um, and then like, so, and so I, I'm like very into interviews. I, I love interviews and I think it's unfair that 
people from this part of the world don't get interviewed as much as everybody else. So there's, um, but they take a lot of time. And so um, they're a different beast and you have to have, you know, and so there's a lot of training involved in this. So um, comics and translations came along because we have a staff of students. So uh, comics and translations came along because two fantastic people came along. So who, uh, editors, so they were, um, uh, Rana Isa, who is, uh, you know, a professor of translation studies, um, and then Lina Raibe, who is, uh, you know, she's a comics, she does, she, she teaches graphic uh, narratives, mm -hmm. and is a great graphic narrative artist. So they're both my colleagues at AUB, and they both wanted to be part of the team. So that was really, really, um, that's been very fulfilling to have those, those aspects. And then we also, you know, um, and and also drama. I mean, we had drama, but then Melia Ayesh came along. She became our drama editor maybe a few years later. So the people, the editors are the ones that are making, you know, have made this uh, journal what it is. And then we're so lucky to have Zena Halabi this year being uh, the Arabic editor who, and she, you know, she, she is professor of Arabic uh, literature at AUB. So we have like, and then of course we have Omar Mismar, who is, uh, who is an artist and um, teaches also in the um, uh, design and architecture. So we have like this uh, all-star um, senior editor team. Hope I didn't miss anybody. Oh, and then there's Ahmad Garbi who's been with us since the beginning. <laughs> and then all these great students, like these amazing students and some of them have graduated. Um, so everybody was able to, has been able to kind of put, um, their mark on it so that's how it's yeah. grown i mean i can't there's one thing I, there's no way i can do this this is not yeah, my for sure you know i can't do all this like no way so this is a team effort um so this yeah, is i mean i i was joking with you before the call that like i put this screenshot here because i was like there are a lot of people I'm, i want to show like the number of the number of faces because it's it takes so much work having lots of people involved. And, and it's just, it's a remarkable thing. So I commend you for that. Um, yeah. I want to ask about um, your involvement um, with, with AUB and this sort of being born out of, um, out of, you know, out of that institution one way or another. Um, and I'm curious about this, the, the like, the, syner the synergy um, or just the relationship with having um, all these AB professors being involved with this and all these AB students being uh, involved with this. I'm, I'm curious about the impact maybe it's had on the students coming out of, the, uh, out of these programs over the last 10 years. Have you seen a change in students? Um, as a result that, of the you know, journal? Yeah, as a result of the journal. No, I mean, I don't think I saw a change necessarily. And I think that they've always, like, I think there's been a change because of, you know, the teaching that we've done. Um, um, Milia, for example, on, who's on the team, Milia Ayesh, she's an a actor and she's uh, um, a, a professor of creative writing. I mean, she works with her students really closely, as do I, as well as do the other um, creative writers in the um, in the program. So I think that when we, what happens is that when we see somebody with a lot of, you know, with, with really good work, we work with them. So it's like the extra mile of like editing and working and bringing them on the team. So they're at, definitely, I see them grow over time um, within the team and definitely I see a change in how they have, they think about. And, um, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I think we have an influence on that, but I'm not saying that, I mean, they already come like pretty, they come talented. And so, mm -hmm. you know, we just kind of, you know, are there for the ride too. So we, I do see them grow a lot like these people on the screen right now. I mean, I look at, a lot of them, I feel like we're so lucky that we get to have them on the team and then we get to grow with each other and they feed us a lot because yeah. I'm good, I'm becoming old. So like, I'm, they're like half my age now, you know? And so they like know way more than I do about what kids want. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm like an old geezer, yeah. you know? Has, uh, do you feel like the audience has changed over time, um, over the over the 10 years or eight years? Yeah. Um, do you yeah, feel like you're talking to a different audience at this point? Yeah, the audience changed when digital 
publishing came up, came about. Yeah. yeah. And when, when we started our yeah. website, that was when everything changed. Um, we started off really slow. We had, just because we're all, we all do this pro bono and in our free time. Um, uh, I mean, it's definitely like more than my free time for me. It's kind of like a second job, but, um, but you know, it's a lot of work. So, so getting that yeah. up was a long process. And then we had to figure out how to publish online, you know, how many times, who's going to manage it? How do we manage it? Who's, you know, so we finally got in a groove. And once we started publishing twice a week and tweeting, okay, don't forget about tweeting the other, yeah. that's my third job. Um, and then there's, you know, <laughs> Instagram and Facebook. And I'm like, no, I don't want to do this. But I mean, there's somebody else that does that. I don't do everything, but I do Twitter. Cause I just, I like Twitter and I like the literary community there and, I always did. I always have handled that that account, but um, so that helps, you know, a lot. And so yeah. we so many different people, and that's why you were asking me before, and maybe you want to jump to this just because it kind of segues. But like the collaborations um, uh, that that come out is as largely, I think, you know, especially the collaborations that are international um, uh, happen due to um, you know due to the this website. <laughs> change yeah. everything because we had like basically if you can imagine we used to publish we, we publish every year we've always published print okay we stick them in a closet in the in, in you know in the the english department floor and then we put them in all of the books bookshops in ras beirut and jamezi yeah. yeah walk door to door launch you know it's like such hard work to like get this journal out, out, yeah, they're, out. In, they're in your trunk for the first six yeah. months of the year yeah, yeah some I people know, like, I know the this struggle year, the first year we distributed for free and people were like, can you come get your journals? Like, what are they doing here? Yeah. So it was like, you know, there's, there's this well, aspect of like the hard copy, it's labor, you know, so the digital. Yeah. So, so I want to, I want to talk about that. So when um, I encourage everybody on the call and whoever is listening to this to check out the website, but you'll notice that when you go on the website and there is, you see all the issues, but the web version of the issue one, two, and three are not there. Yeah. Um, and so, and as I was looking at, I told you this before the call, but like, as I was looking at the covers, which are on the screen right now, there seems to be this, like, this uh, visual idea. Okay. You know, there's going to be a theme. We're going to have some sort of, um, some sort of face reimagined on the cover. Um, and it continues, uh, continues into the fourth, uh, fourth um, theme as well. But, then it, then it changes. And so I'm curious about that change. When, you know, when did you guys decide to, is, it is, am I imagining that? Is there something that's actually going on that was a concerted, a concerted choice or, um, or not? Okay. Uh, yeah, those, there's some things that are choice and intentional and there's some yeah. things that happen on accident. Okay, so, and there's some things that happen uh, by mistake, not just accident. Okay, so there's, for example, the first the first issue was created by, uh, I mean, all of the designs are created by students. Okay, and they're very, as you can see, very talented students. They do great design, but also under the leadership of Ahmed Gharbi, who's a fantastic designer. So issue one, um, there was this very interesting designer, um, uh, and. Uh, so he 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 loved using his grandma as a subject. Okay, so he had all these pictures of his grandma, and he decided that this was going to be the cover of the first issue. And I really loved it. Like I just thought it was really cool, and it made me think about like how um, you know there's different faces uh, that we can you know bring up. So it was about like faces and people. And I asked a lot of people at the time, they said, yeah, go for it. Like, that's a good idea. I was asking artists and designers. Um, so we did the second one, which is, this is Omar Khoury's work. Um, he does a lot of self portraits. And then we and then we did another call and then we got this one um, from, uh, I'm, I'm forgetting names right now, but I'm sorry. Um, and, uh, okay. and then I think the fourth one, yeah, the fourth one we did it. And then some of the team and uh, the students especially, um, we're like, can we please do a different cover? So I was like, really kind of like, no, and let's stick to it. You know, everybody says it's good, whatever. 
And then on the fifth issue was the year of the garbage crisis in, in mm. Beirut and in Lebanon, I mean. And so there was a piece in it that was a graphic narrative that, and there was a, uh, uh, it was a graphic narrative of this rat. Okay, so there was this rat that was, and so the rat was gonna be on the cover. I decided like, that's it. The rat is going on the cover. This is indicative of this year, it's whatever. So, uh, so Ahmed was like, last minute, like that rat is not going on the cover. So he's like, nope. And so the other, one of the designers that year made this very nice poster for the launch. And so they decided mm -hmm. to use the design for it. So very graph, uh, very text-based um, and design versus image. Um, and so we're like, okay, let's do it. And actually we changed the printing that year. We did an exposed spine, matte, um, and everybody loved it so much more than all the previous ones. So it was like this last minute collision yeah. of things. Um, and, and so then, that, yeah. No, I'm curious about also the, the move to, to web. And I think the move to, to web started in issue four. No, that's the thing. It didn't start at issue four, but issue four is when we started using Google Drive. Okay. And before that, we used another uh, app, and um, it was very. It's basically putting up issues one, two, and three uh, is going to be a real pain. So we just yeah. haven't gotten around to it. Okay, I forgive you. <laughs> Don't worry. So I want to talk now um, because I have t so many more questions. So I want to move a little bit to the most recent one, um, which is called Sea Change, which was. Um, um, there seems to be a number of changes that are represented in this issue. There is the issue, there is, it's the first one that is dual language, um, fully dual language. And then there's also tons of changes that are happening in Lebanon at the time. But before the call, you told me that this predated the Theoda of uh, 2019 in October, 2019. So yeah. aside from the, the language, is there any other reason why you chose that title? Aside from the language? No, it wasn't a matter of- Oh, um, maybe it's not a language at all. So yeah, so what's the significance of the title? Yeah, so um, I mean, it was just, it was the day where, I mean, I, I don't, we, we sat, honestly, it was like this moment, we sat by the sea, the editors did, and we were just thinking about things and brainstorming, um, and this is what came about. and. Um, and we, you know, I think that there was, and I remember feeling like there's, there is something changing, something in the air. And, um, um, and the fact that we're sitting next to the sea, I think ha had some influence on that, on, on coming up with the title. And when we heard it, we just were all, you know, for it. And we had a long discussion about it. Um, and it was pure coincidence that the Saura started in October. We printed the next month. Um, and, uh, and you know, it was just a coincidence. And but it, yeah. it was more than a coincidence in that these things are building up in your mind, and you're not yeah. necessarily un feeling them or knowing them or being able to put your finger on them. But there was obviously something there that you know yeah. felt like it made sense. Yeah, that that makes sense to me. Um, I'm curious about the reaction uh, that you've. Uh, heard uh, with the first dual language uh, publication. Do you think it's expanded the audience or changed the audience or changed the reaction, uh, changed the experience for, uh, uh, expanded the, the pool of possible contributors? Like what's been the experience? Um, I think it's a, a slow change for sure. And we've yeah. been, um, we actually, um, we got a grant to, to push the uh, Arabic a bit. So to pay Arabic writers in Arabic um, so that, you know, there's more um, awareness that we, do, you know, we have this because we're known for it to be an Anglophone uh, journal. So, I mean, we just need to be, you know, but we've had quite a few and yeah, I mean, I, I'm not sure. I, we'd have to ask the Arabic editors more about that. But I, I, we did just do a solicitation, a round of solicitations and they were very excited to be published. And um, what we realized is that um, there are very few uh, journals that publish Arabic writing. So we kind of are situated to, to, to do a lot with this, you know, as much energy as we have. Yeah, I think it's amazing. Uh, I mean, selfishly, I'm also interested in asking you because throughout Fikra, we are starting to do 
um, hosting events in Arabic, trying to oh. translate our curriculum and our pedagogy all into Arabic yeah. to try to figure out to um, to you know work with new presenters and stuff like that. So I'm asking for a friend. That'll be interesting. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> um, so the one of the things that struck me uh, as I was going through the website is just um, polished thing is like. Know how it is to just put out really, really polished stuff, um, and like, I guess my question is, who are your inspirations? Like, who are you? Not only you, but as a team, who are you referencing and responding to? Are you in conversation at least in, in, uh, internally with other other publications where you're like, oh my god, I love what they're doing in Berlin, or oh my god, have you seen this? You know. Um, like, I love what Slavs and Tartars are doing and we got to do something like that. Like, what are you, who are you referencing, if anyone? Listen, I, I mean, I do, uh, I do a lot of, um, I mean, I teach creative writing. I have a few master's degrees. Uh, I do a lot of writing. I read a lot. So um, there's all kinds of journals, especially, you know, um, many US based journals where that have influenced even how we design, how we put the design out, yeah. um, and to what level. You know, my education has influenced me a lot, and the and and the connections from there. Um, so there's so many journals. I don't know I I exactly like who I, I should um, who I should uh, mention, but um, there are several. And if you guys want, I can send you a list. I have one. Um, but yeah, so I, I do take, I do take a lot of, um, I took all, a lot of my, uh, of what we did from the beginning, you know, from US based journals mostly. Yeah. There's also just like a, a great like culture of publications coming out of Beirut, you know, um, yeah. as well. There, there are so many. Um, okay. So I guess, uh, a question is sort of a future focused question. Um, what are you most excited about right now that you're working on? Um, is there a ninth issue that's in the in the works right now? Um, yes, there is. Uh, it's actually at the printer right now. Oh, and wow. No it, way. It, it would like it's done. Uh, it's about it's cooking. And um, we are going to have a uh, we're going to have a virtual launch with the read, with readers uh, in a month. And I'm really excited for that because of just what I, I'm seeing here. And I mean, I have to really admit that I'm very t I'm very terrible about going to these things. And oftentimes because some of the things uh, that I need to go to are um, at the at times I can't do or because they're international and I can't it's like middle of the night here or they're here and they're seven o'clock and I got to put this kid to bed and I've got done all these other things during the day so um but so I feel really bad about that but the thing is is that they're so great because you can get people in for the first time from everywhere so like right now yeah. I'm seeing people not only my friends but I'm seeing um people we published um and some of the team members um but also people we published from all over um, yeah. So, and that's, all, that's really exciting because we've always been, uh, we've always, we publish sometimes 50% of the work is from outside of Beirut. And it's always sad that like at the launches, you can't meet these people. And, and it's like Zoom existed, but we didn't, it didn't really exist in, you know, like it yeah. is now. Um, so it, it's opened a bit of um, leeway for us to kind of do these types of readings and things. So I'm excited for that. I'm excited. We just talked about the launch today. I'm excited for it for, you know, to get the people from here and there to to do the reading and you know have a chat. So, do you like if if I if I picked up um, the the episode or the issue that um, happened during the 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 trash crisis, right? Or yeah. if I picked up the the new issue that's coming out now, um, how? How, how do you balance creating a, a sort of a journal that's supposed to be maybe be timeless um, or and timely? Like, how do you balance that or find that balance where you want it to be relevant, obviously, um, but are, are you even concerned with like having it be too focused on the news or too focused on the, the oh. current events? Like, is, is, this, is this issue like Laudo and, and COVID? And, and blast like in three parts. No, um, it's not. <laughs> yeah, so how do, you how do you balance that? How do you find that balance? Because I could imagine that is a, that's a natural tension, right? 
Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, it's definitely a question. Uh, well, what's funny too is that we come up with these themes and then somehow something happens. So, you know, there's this serendipity uh, where we had we called for health and illness in last January. And then we found ourselves locked in because of COVID in, in March. Wait, it's called health and illness? The issue, it's nine, it's called health and illness, it but it wasn't because of COVID. So what happened is we... It's actually, uh, I, I personally uh, uh, suggested this, this one because I was interested in hearing people's stories and, and things that, you know, um, stories that people don't talk about because I had a personal experience. So I was very interested in it. Um, and then March came and pandemic. And uh, so we're like, oh, this gives a new dimension to the issue. So we extended. And then we found that, um, People really had a hard time processing, obviously, what was going on in their lives. So it wasn't easy to, to write about the pandemic, in fact, uh, or, or their feelings or their situation during the pandemic. It was a whole new way of living and it wasn't, you know, something that was easy to write about. A lot of people just said, no, you know, they were going to write before and then they're like, I can't. So, um, and, and, and everybody found their, themselves in different mental states. Um, so, um, and, and the thing is, is that, uh, what was interesting is that it didn't turn out to be a pandemic issue. There's a few pieces on pandemic, a few, there's a few pieces, but there's stuff about, um, there's abortion pieces, uh, there's, uh, there's abortion piece, there's, uh, you know, um, uh, there's all kinds of things. Um, I mean, there's a the guy getting his appendix out. I mean, there's like, uh, it ranges, uh, yeah. you know, the stories. So, um, do you, do you, when you send out the, the open call, is there um, more information than just the phrase? Or is it like, you know, we're talking about, you know, uh, sorry, it's health and, what was it? Health and, and illness. What's the theme again? Health and illness. Health and wellness? Illness. Health and Ill illness, yeah, yeah. yeah. So if, if illness, yeah. Do you just say, okay, the theme is going to be health and illness? Take, take what you, you know, make whatever you want from it? Or is there a sort of a accompanying? No, you know, there's a long text that we write. I mean, there's, there's a, it's, a, it's a call, you know, it's a yeah. call and, and we're clear about, you know, what we're thinking about. And then we take what comes, but also we make sure to diversify. Um, and, and naturally, I mean, there's, there's um, work about um, environmental health in there. There's all, all kinds of things. Um, and also I solicited a piece um, from, uh, the head of the ER, and she told her story about the night of August 4, and we felt like, you know, when that happened, we couldn't, we couldn't not include that. So the current events yeah. take place, but I mean, it's literature, so literature is timeless, and it's also, you know, sometimes things end up being historical in some way, a historical yeah. text. Oh, okay, so I have two questions, and I want to move on to the quick Q&A, then open it up to the, everyone. Um, in reading uh, some of the, re the essays that you've written, um, in particular, Days of Pearls, which is really beautifully written, um, there seems to be like a, a focus on on decay. Um, maybe I, maybe I'm misunderstanding that, but there that seems to be like this overarching theme. Um, yeah. Do you think that is that largely instructed the? or informed uh, by living in Beirut and living in Hamra <laughs> in particular, where you see a lot of decay constantly. And, and even like there is this like focus on nostalgia, which is also in, um, implies decay. Um, it, was that a feature of your writing before you moved here? Or is that really something that's emerged late in the last you know, 10 years or so? Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, definitely Hamra and Beirut have these particular uh, characteristics that, you know, inspire me um, and that I become obsessed with and, you know, and, and also the, the, the there's a man dying next door is very much about neighbors um, and the way that we interact mm -hmm. with other people and how, how we, you know, and, and, and the neighborhood. So I really, that's something that I really love. Um, and I love that I can hear my neighbors, um, even though, you know, um, the, the, the piece is not about loving my neighbors. It's, but that, that's where it comes from, like, 
I love getting to know the shop owners. Um, and so, you know, uh, Days of Pearls is also about the shop owners. Yeah. Uh, so, um, so, but there is decay, yeah. And it's uh, something that's a big fear of mine uh, living here that there's this, um, you know, that there's this, that there is this decay that people lived in another era. Uh, yeah. And and lived previously, somehow it's it's following us, and that there's remnants of it, um, but there's also these beautiful um, things uh, to to experience and to, and to interact with. So uh, it's kind of that uh, interplay. Yeah, that I mean that resonates with me a lot. Um, okay, I'm going to try to ask my last question before we move on. I'm really really curious about um, the project that um, you have done with Bajil. Uh, um, our foundation, their poetry prize, um, mm -hmm. where there were submissions from all over the all over the world um, yeah. and all over, over the region. Obviously, um, what was that experience like? Like uh, anything that surprised you? Anything that sort of tickled you in terms of the types of submissions um, that you? Well, got? no. I mean, we we had nothing to do with the content. Actually, we were asked to publish, um, which was great because you know, I mean. It, they they had they they actually got um, uh, the people who were the organizers were Hind uh, um, um, Shufani and um, um, sorry um, and uh, Zena Hashimbek and uh, Marsha Lynx Quayle. Yeah. So Zena Hashimbek is a poet and Marsha yeah. Lynx Quayle are Arab lit. Hopefully, um, both of them hopefully will those be. Those are on great the people. Soon. Yeah, you I was going to say both of them. I think are going to be on the series soon. Yeah, so and uh, so they they actually organized it, and they got the they got the editors or the judges, and all the judges. I really uh, we we published some of them. Like Hala Alian was in our first issue. She was a, just a fresh graduate from AUB, so she was the she was the um, she was the student of one of uh, my colleagues. Anyway, so uh, so I like the the judges, and so when they asked me, and I I, I like all of these women. I appreciate their work and. Uh, so they ask, you know, would you like to, to publish these uh, for us? So, and be like basically a site. Uh, um, so, so we did it, yeah. So that was our role in that. Yeah. And, uh, and I thought it was a really nice uh, opportunity. And I, I think it will lead to other collaborations too. I, I don't mind being um, yeah. like a container for, for other people's content. Yeah. Not okay, me. cool. Let's go, let's go to the uh, Q and A, and then um, the, we'll go open up to the everybody. So, first question: What are you reading or watching right now? Okay, just so you know, I don't like these questions, but it's okay. I'm gonna <laughs> <laughs> no, because uh, I mean, if you knew like how uh, my husband and I watch shows, it's ridiculous. Like, it's no judgment, Rima. Zero, <laughs> Zero judgment. What? Zero judgment. Not about judgment it's just like it's just sad you know i mean we can't I, I i'm the one that usually falls asleep but anyway uh we i did start watching love and anarchy because my friend zena told me to watch it and i love it it's so funny okay. um and uh, we just started watching the dig movie and i fell asleep halfway through so we gotta watch it again so it's usually the story is we're slow on on these things um reading i started um i just want to plug a book that i love so much that i just read um which is um, called Like Love, has nothing to do with the Middle East. Um, although the person uh, who wrote it is called, uh, her name is Michelle Morano. She used to be my teacher at DePaul University. Um, and I really love her writing and she did come to Beirut and she loves Beirut. Um, but she wrote a really excellent um, collection of essays about love. And I really highly recommend you get your hands on them. And I just started Liars Club, which is so weird. I don't know why I started it, but I, I was interested in the writing, um, Mary Carr. Mm. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, it's a it's it's a classic. So I just started that, and yeah, that's that's what's going on. Okay. And student papers, of course, that's what I yeah. read all the time. Okay. Who would you love to shadow for a day, past or present? I, I thought a lot about. I mean, what's weird is the first there was somebody that popped in my head right away, and I couldn't get her out, and I just was like, this is you know, I mean. I just really admire her work uh, or, or her life story. Um, Zora Neale Hurston, it's so, it's very kind of random, but it's not because I, I read her biography and, and she's uh, just such an interesting yeah. 
person um, and lived such a difficult life um, and, uh, and became this fantastic writer. And um, she lived in a time where there was, you know, all of these like, you know, these writing collectives and, you know, I don't know. So I, I just would be, you know, her, her life story is so interesting. Yeah, that's, that's a good one. Um, also Harlem at the time, come on. Wouldn't yeah, I mean, exactly. Wouldn't be a bad place. To... Parties and big yeah. hats. And... Okay, um, what do people most misunderstand about your work? Uh, I think that some people think it's glamorous, but it's like literally 90% pajama and like screen. It's terrible. I mean, I, I, I don't think, I, 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 if I were like maybe the editor of Vogue, it'd be fun or something, but I mean, it's not, it's not glamorous. Um, but there is one thing that's serious about uh, that I wanted to mention. Um, and that is that some people think that we edit because we don't like their work. Like mm. we'll be like, you know, we, we actually put a lot of effort in editing um, and it's something that we take pride in. Uh, and I'm saying we, because we all do. I mean, again, this is a team effort. And so there's been people that have taken great offense to edits. Um, and it's something, it's a subject that I really am very interested in, especially in the Arab world where in Arabic, there is no editing. Like it's mm -hmm. actually non-existent. It's not a concept. So um, uh, I find that very interesting in terms of like corrections. Like you're, you're, you, you know, it's as if you're making corrections, but you're not. You're actually trying to enhance mm -hmm. the work and helping. And some people have been like, sorry, no, and been very angry. So I yeah. think the misconception is like edits are not to put you down. Edits are like, we believe in, in your work and we would like to work with you. And that's it, <laughs> you know? Yeah, that's a good one. Okay, really quickly, because I just looked at the time, whose work do you admire or are inspired by? I'm sure the list is long, but if you were to pick one or two. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I really admire my colleagues' work. Uh, um, lots of women I, I recently met and I can't even say all of their names, but I will just, I'll just say the names of the people on the team like Zaina Halabi, Sarah Mrad, uh, Lina Munzer, Mini Ayash, Lina Raibi, Noor Turkmani, Rana Isa. Uh, and I'm not gonna go further because there's many, many women that I recently met because we did a, we started a, um, a women's faculty alliance at AUB and met all these great women who are doctors and doing a lot of great research in the field um, and psychologists and artists. So. These are the people who are really inspiring me these days, especially because in Beirut, we are suffering every day from very bad news. So we yeah. really are leaning on each other, so. Absolutely. Okay, great. So the first question comes from Joan. She said, is there a story behind the title? Mm. Yeah, okay, Joan. Um, so yeah, that's the question from Joan. Is there a story behind the title, Rusted Radishes? Uh, again, silly. Um, not that it's not yeah so rusted radishes was basically born of a, a writing exercise that the original editors did myself and crystal hoffman and uh and busha batluni um we just sat down and we like made a list of adjectives and list of nouns kind of like an exercise we would give to students and then we started crisscrossing and we actually had a different name before which was a terrible garage band name which was burnt sparrow um, and then we were like, uh, went to the designer, we're like, oh, we're starting a magazine called Burnt Sparrow. And she's like, all I see is a dead bird remount. That's all I see. And she's like, this is not very enlightening. This is not fun. Nobody's going to want to submit to it. And I'm like, I rushed back. I'm like, we can't do Burnt Sparrow. <laughs> this, is not, this can't be it. And uh, then we're like, what's the next one on the list? <laughs> Rusted radishes. So basically, but also it was also like the idea of like, an image, a fresh image, uh, something that, you know, you can't necessarily describe and, and is not, you know, a thing. Yeah. Well, the good news is if you ever do start a sort of a emo garage band, you got the name <laughs> nailed down perfectly. <laughs> for that. Okay, I'm going to ask uh, Reem's question, who had to drop off, but it's a good question. How have the events of the past two years in Beirut, revolution, economic crisis, COVID explosion, impacted the identity of Beirut as a revolving door? And how might it uh, impact it in the coming year? Yeah, I mean, this is a really good question because uh, it's more like a one-way exit <laughs> now. Wow. 
<laughs> so it's no longer as much as a revolving door and people are, you know, Mikey, you know, people are leaving. Um, but I think that it's going to open doors in different ways because um, I don't think that Beirut is a place that uh, stops. I hate to be cliche, but it's like it does, uh, you know, do its thing. Uh, but I think that what's hard is that we don't have a lot of people coming in. Um, so what's interesting is that with COVID and the internet, I mean, we, we might have different new interesting ways to connect. Yeah. Um, so, so I don't think that it's going to be, I think Belakis it's going to be something uh, we're going to have to reach out internationally more. And that's the way we're thinking about, we're thinking more about digital, you know, going digital more so because also printing is becoming very expensive. Um, and printing is not sustainable actually at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I, for Africa, I always tell people, like, I always say, like, we're all in the diaspora. There's like, I don't believe really in the diaspora. I, I just, I think it's, it's revolving and moving always. And so, yeah. Um, okay. Uh, the next one comes from Jude. Jude, I'm going to uh, ask you to unmute yourself. Hi. Hi. So um, my question is that, what do you think of the Arab-founded indie publications and them being overpowered by other white-founded spaces? So um, like white-founded journals and galleries, um, et cetera. And when they mostly focus on Arabs. So do you think that they overlap um, and then one overpowers the other or are they just separate entities? I'm sorry, but can you just clarify something? Where do you find it? You mean like in general, uh, the, the fact that you're saying um, you're calling them white founded journals are more dominant on the scene. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, sorry. So yeah, um, I was just wondering in terms of the, the power structure, um, mm -hmm. especially that the indie Arab founded zines are kind of more underground. Yeah, I mean, Jude, I, I, I think that, you know, it's our, it's, it's really our job to, to, to make a, I mean, uh, I guess, um, I think it's really our job to, to get, make ourselves be more important. <laughs> um, I, and I, I say that in a way um, that we need to really support each other. Um, and we also need lots of funds. Um, and so, um, yeah, it's dominant. I, I don't, uh, it is interesting. Sometimes I have interactions where people are not interested in the US and in, in this middle, in this journal that's based in Beirut, uh, bothers me a lot. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I have to work toward that, but, it, um, sometimes people reach out because they are interested in Middle East studies or whatever. Um, I put myself in their shoes and I think about, you know, how much am I reaching out to Far East publications, um, and other, so um, it's just a work in progress. So I, I think uh, the power structures come down to, to money and really promoting ourselves and each other. Um, okay, the next question comes from Celine. Hi, so Hi. Um, <laughs> I wanted to ask uh, uh, first, Thank you so much for like introducing yourself and telling us more about yourself. It's always been like fascinating to just, you know, see the behind the scenes, but also how things are going generally. Um, anyway, I wanted to ask about the future of publishing and where you think it's headed, especially considering like you were capable of um, thankfully physically publishing um, health and illness, but how do you feel like publishing in general is headed? here uh hi Celine Celine's on our team she's she's a superstar um student <laughs> um, student student intern um, um um no I mean it's in deep crisis uh publishing and you know I mean it's in serious serious crisis um at the moment so where it's going yeah digital is one answer but it's not the only answer especially like for schools um and we still need the book um so um we need to create collectives that you know basically um you know support each other and how we're going to get these journals and books and print out there and come up with ways to diversify by going online seeing how we can sell pdfs um 
Um, so, you know, and see how we can keep prices down locally. So we have to have uh, money coming in from outside and we need to be able to still allow people to afford the book here. Because when I go to get a book now, it's all priced um, at the dollar rate. So I'm having to buy a book, you all know this, who live here at 120,000 lira, which is like, you know, two trips to the grocery store or, you know, more. Um, so so it's they've become prohibitively expensive. They're, they're basically a luxury item now. Uh, so we need to figure out how we're going to print af affordably and or diversify our streams and be able to actually subsidize what people use here. So uh, um, it's, you know, it's a work in progress because this is something that publishers and printmakers need to get together and, and discuss and see how they're going to support each other. Again, I don't have answers for, for that, except for the one answer I know is that we have to go digital in some way, shape or form. For the for the for the time being, at least, and it'll probably be well into the future. Great, thanks, uh, thanks, Adine. Okay, so last quick question from Jeffrey. While I wrap, go ahead, Jeff. Fima, this is wonderful. Thank you so much. So I wrote my question in the chat, but I'm going to ask it again. I'm hoping you can share some thoughts with us, and this is really based. Uh, triggered by your moving piece that you wrote after August 4. And uh, I'm hoping you can have, can share some thoughts with us tonight uh, about your positionality as a writer and as a publisher and what that means um, in terms of comparing uh, at moments of revolution and moments before the uprising uh, in terms of the submissions in terms of you soliciting for articles, because I'm assuming as the case with many alternative platforms, uh, there I think there was an abundance of pieces. We all got a moment of clarity or a moment that we wanted to reflect and write about. So yeah. can you share some thoughts about your positionality, your thinking um, uh, before October 17 and after October 17 or during October 17? And if there are any lessons learned for you as a writer and how that could shape uh, the discourse moving forward. Mm. Why well, do you have to ask me such a hard question? <laughs> you guys, this is Jeffrey. He's, uh, he's a historian based in Beirut and he is a wonderful friend um, and a great supporter. So, um, um, so uh, how did October 17, uh, how did it, um, affect how uh, my of my own writing or how I look at others. So you're talking to me as a writer, right? Um, and what kind of language we use and how, you know, is that what, this, I just yeah. want to make sure I understand the question. Yeah, 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 sorry, he's on mute. Okay, okay. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, I like the, what you said about like moments of clarity and how, you know, there were these pieces that came out and, uh, and what happened, uh, on August 4, um, you know, in the days that followed, I was a bit frozen and uh, I had this intense, um, feeling that I needed to help people and that I didn't know how, like it was absolutely just beyond my understanding of how to rake through glass and, and help people physically. Like I, I was the, f it was the first time that I felt, uh, completely helpless. Like I, I usually have like, oh no, we could do this. We could do that. I have an idea. Like this was beyond my understanding. So I remember I went down and I, I was like, I got to go home right now. And like, I, I went home and I started writing and I sent this editor a message and I'm like, I got to write, I got to write something. And I've never done that before. Um, and, uh, and it was a moment of clarity and it makes, and sometimes I go back to that essay and I say, how did I write that? So it did um, somehow give me a sense of, and I always tell my students and I always you know, have learned that you know, we don't have to write about only the big things. We can write about the little uh, ordinary, you know, we, we write about ordinary life and I write a lot about ordinary life. Um, and it doesn't have to be this big moment. Uh, but I did learn that you know, people do grasp onto that. They do wanna see those big moment essays. Um, and so it did give me a little bit of like questioning of what kind of writing do I want to do? Um, and, and also the moment of the Beirut writer, you know, who, what are we going to write? What's going to come out of here? Um, and people are waiting and interested. And, and what really was a bit 
disturbing to me was that we, we were a trend and then we ended, you know, that trend ended. And I, it was very, 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 very clear to me that we, uh, you know, things, these disasters and catastrophes um, end as soon as the media circus ends, you know? And um, I felt that I was part of, I felt a little bit part of that media circus, although I also felt, you know, I didn't feel guilty about writing it or anything like that. I feel like, you know, it needed to be written. And I feel like I want to keep my promise that I, that I, that I said in the end um, that, you know, it is true that like, you know, we, we, you know, we want revenge. Um, and so I felt like a responsibility uh, and I feel like everybody felt a responsibility to do something. And I think that what the realization is, is that it's very hard to, um, and go back to those feelings and continue and to get people's attention for it. Um, and, and so this is the struggle and, uh, and, and it's something very interesting to think about too. Thank you for the question, Jeffrey. Thanks, Jeffrey. Okay, we are three minutes over, Rima. This, I could talk to you for hours. Um, I wanna just wrap up by saying I posted a link in the chat to give us feedback. Please uh, do if you'd like to tell us if this was good. Um, if you'd like to support Africa and keep us uh, growing and growing and keep these events free um, and open to all, each one of these events takes a long, long time to prepare. Um, it is a labor of love, but um, the only way we can keep on doing it is if members of the community support. So please consider being um, one of our monthly supporters. Um, and stay in touch. Thank you so much, it was such a pleasure. It's such a pleasure, Mikey and Jed. Thank you for all your work and for this project. I really love it. And the Atikada Afia and all of you people who came today, I really, really appreciate it. And I'm so thankful that you all showed up. And yeah, so nice to see my friends here too. Thanks, Mikey. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Oh, and, and this is going to be on YouTube and on our podcast. Yeah, you'll be on YouTube. This will be on YouTube and on our podcast. We'll send it out. Please send it to friends who may have missed today's event who might be interested. Okay, everybody have a nice day. I'm gonna stay on for a few more minutes. If anyone has any questions, um, I'll stick around to answer them. But if you have to go, I totally understand. Bye. Bye.